white and wide, blood of Christ the crucified. From your hands, your feet, your side, Jesus, I trust in you. All right, we call this uh, the King comes to clean house. <laughs> And you said this on the 17th, and I've been sitting on it, but it, it was like we're, we've had a lot of, a lot of revelations coming at us. Um, and this is really, really good news, and it has some more really good news at the end of it I want to share with you. So, um, dreams, she said this dream has two parts that I believe parallel one another and tie into another dream. I had of the little Hitler. I asked Father for a verse and put my finger down on Jeremiah 12 and 14. On the text that said, I will pluck them up from off their land. And it started out with uh, Michael Hare and I uh, walking down a white concrete sidewalk of the nicely paved UBM neighborhood street. And obviously this is a spiritually how we're seen. Um, I believe that UBM here reflects other unleavened bread or word ministries who are getting cleaned up and prepared for the coming of the Lord and, and his people. And um, also I think that this is larger UBM. So uh, the street was very straight and freshly paved with uh, black top. And all of our houses uh, had white trim on the windows, the eaves, and the posts. And all the yards were well trimmed, and all of our bushes and trees were pruned. And I believe this is a description that reflects that um, the brethren are getting cleaned up, and their flesh cut down, and um, getting ready for the groom's appearing. Um, UBM is cleaned out of those uh, going into captivity for their sins and as the text above states um, the houses she said the houses looked like they had been built back in the 1930s and 40s and were all built on a hill and we were walking up to David's house which was higher up than mine next door and I believe this is just reflecting all who did not go into captivity, lived in the old ways of the forefathers and the faith. Um, and I believe that the David here is um, representative of the David man-childs. She said it was nighttime outside, but there was the golden glow of light coming from David's window. I could also see well by the light of the moon. And, uh, well, you know, the moon is, can be a representation of the bride, right? Reflecting the light of the sun. And as we were walking, Michael was telling me the same thing that he had said at the morning prayer meeting that morning. He said, they won't ever look at David in the eyes while they are talking to him. They're afraid of him. Yeah, we discovered this. More so even recently, you know. They're such uh, so worried that they'll bump into me or I'll be there. <laughs> it's not them. and they, I don't think they know it, but it's the demons, you know. This is true, and the captives won't talk to me. And uh, they will talk to others to slander me, but their demons are afraid. And I know why they're afraid, because the Lord has given us authority. And it's about to go forth. We came up to David's house, and I was able to see through the walls of his house. It was the same floor plan and design as my paternal godfather, grandfather's house in Highland Park in Texas, in Dallas, when I was growing up. Our house, I believe here, represents uh, our natural life, which should be in accordance with our spiritual forefathers in the faith. And, um, in other words, in obedience to God, in obedience to his word, and 
not changing the word in any way, not modernizing the word in any way, but just believing what it says and acting upon it and holding to it. Uh, it is our landmark, so to speak, our boundary. I could see David getting ready for a strategic local UBM meeting in the dining room. I got to tell you, folks, there's um, something the Lord's told us over and over is a lot of you out there are coming here. Um, some in, some pretty quickly and some in the middle of the trib and so on and so forth. And um, so this local meeting is about things to come. He had his uh, Bible and several UBM books <clears throat> at the head of the table on the corner of my grandmother's old rectangular wooden table. And uh, she said, this is probably the same table as the one in the attic from the Hitler dream. Yeah, I believe that that represented uh, the Last Supper, Passover, when uh, the man-child Jesus was going to his cross. She said, behind the head of the table was a large, white, dry erase board that was set on a tripod stand. And behind it were the stairs that led up to some attic rooms that my grandfather had built to accommodate my dad and his five brothers and his sister because the house originally only had three bedrooms. So anyway, our forefathers in the faith passed down to us a a high and a heavenly inheritance given by God through Jesus and we should accept nothing less. And he said, I believe this is this is to is a representation of the same attic room and stairs from the Hitler dream where David called me to come downstairs and plunder Hitler Hitler's gold and silver. Well, Hitler of course represents the, the factious leadership that hates and crucifies the people of God. And uh, this leadership stole gold and silver from them, as Hitler did the Jews. But all will be plundered from them. And, of course, it was from Hitler, too. And this happens just before the wilderness tribulation, as the as with the Egyptians, when they gave uh, this into the hands of the Israelites when they were leaving Egypt, right? And... She said, once Michael and I were inside, we stood at the right side corner of the table further down and we watched the local UBM brethren coming in and taking their seats at the table. Michael began to explain to me what was happening as I watched David begin drawing X's and O's in strategic places on the board with arrows going this way and that. <laughs> and opening his Bible and the UBM books and pointing at different scriptures and texts. He looked like a football coach, writing out the different plays and strategies uh, for his players to defeat their opponents. Um, of course, the word will, will make us wiser than those who ignore it. And uh, like a football game, when you already know the opponent's plays, and, um, you know, let us route them in, in prayer and spiritual warfare. The Lord's given us authority. And, the, you know, this faction has had its place. It's had its purpose. The purpose was good, uh, good for us, and uh, actually good for the factious because of their problems that they needed to deal with. And one, but, so it was good for all around Um you know, it, only people I can say it hasn't, go, isn't going to prosper, of course, is um, those that are reprobated. And she said, I watched as Merlene and Don began to nod their heads and others began to nod their heads and as each came to the understanding of what must be done. And then I heard David say, uh, we're going to have to move our meeting to the house next door that is higher up the hill. <clears throat> well, praise God, we are moving higher, much like the bride in Esther was being separated from the other women. In Esther 2 and 9, 
we were told, and the maiden pleased him, and he obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification. Whatever you do, uh, please the Holy Spirit, and uh, he will speedily be able to give you your things for purification. With her portions, and the seven maidens, who were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And those are the seven attributes of the Lord, uh, which we come into, according to Peter. And he removed her and her maidens to the best place of the house of the women. And then in 16, it says, So Esther was taken into unto King Ahasuerus, into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained favor and kindness in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And it's very interesting that we'll come back to this story in, in just a few minutes because it's, um, it has a lot to do with this, this parable. So we all left David's house and walked up the hill next door. And when Michael and I got inside, we saw that a bunch of Hispanics had squatted in the house and were there illegally. This house had also belonged to David, and it was supposed to be kept spotlessly clean. But these Hispanics had decorated the house for a wild fiesta. Now, I usually have to explain this, but most of you that have been with us for a while don't don't need an explanation. But God loves all peoples regardless of race, and and so do I. Uh, But this is a parable. And uh, we in America understand this. It's on the news all the time and, you know, um, what's going on. So this parable just really sticks out, you know. It has nothing to do with favoring one race above another, which uh, we're to know no man after the flesh, as the word commands us. And um, know everyone after the spirit, right? And uh, it speaks of uh, spiritual foreigners that have come across the spiritual borders of our promised land illegally to uh, leaven our population. And these represent squatters in our promised land, like the Israelites were given the land, but the Canaanites had to be removed by warfare. And we've had uh, dreams of factious people leaving the land. And over five years, we have seen this happen. After they fall into faction, they leave the land. And that's with those who would not ultimately repent. But um, there are still some who our dreams show us will be leaving. And uh, they've lost their battle, um, and the hornet is driving them out, and so to speak. The Lord's given us parallels between the Israelites conquering the land and, and the promised land and, and our promised land because he has made definite promises and many of them concerning a piece of property for his people and uh, a large piece of property for his people. And um, we know lots of people are going to take advantage of it and they're going to need it in the days to come. And the gospel is going to go forth from a wilderness setting um, around the world. And uh, many man-child ministers are coming to raise up um, witnesses to go forth everywhere. But first, we got the, um, the revival that's coming, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And after that, the man-child revival. And there were pinatas uh, hanging everywhere and piles of dishes of food. It was a very gluttonous occasion. And there were wild and unruly Hispanic children running everywhere. 
Uh, well, I think this is speaking of uh, their chaotic lives of living to feed the flesh, <clears throat> just like the faction is, and destroying their children. Um, it causes God to evict them before the Israelites as they take the land. And uh, she goes on to say, and loud music playing. And I thought to myself, am I in the right place? I thought this was where David said the meeting was moved to. Well, let me point something out to you. When David uh, took the reins, um, he went to Jerusalem and conquered it. And uh, the people that were there, um, the Jebusites, uh, had to be driven from the land. So remember that. Uh, Michael said, this is uh, the right house, but these people don't belong here. This house belongs to David. Uh, let's get out of here and tell David what's going on. Well, uh, foreign invaders who are not born of the word or the king's seed, and this will come up again later in this revelation also, very, very important. And they are, they're being exposed and removed through faction, meaning separation, and the house is almost cleaned. We've had some really good dreams recently, and I've got some I haven't shared, shared with you uh, about this. And then we will see the king and his revival. Praise be to God. Ezekiel 44 and 6 says, And thou shalt say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you of all your abominations, in that you have brought in foreigners, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to profane it, even my house, when you offer my bread, the fat, and the blood. And they have broken my covenant to add unto all your abominations. And you shall not keep the charge of my holy things, but you have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. And thus saith the Lord, No foreigner, uncircumcised in heart, and uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary of any foreigners that are among the children of Israel. Now, of course, this is speaking about Ezekiel's temple. And, uh, you know, uh, people think the Jews are going to build Ezekiel's temple, which is impossible just because of this text right here and quite a few others in there. We know that this has nothing to do with building a physical temple. Uh, nobody can enter this temple but those who are circumcised in heart. Nobody. And we could, Paul tells us, of course, that a Jew is one who is circumcised in heart, not in flesh. Right? Um, and if it's a temple that only these people can enter, it's not a physical temple. It is the spiritual temple. It is what we've been teaching for years, is um, the New Testament raising up of the kingdom of God in the image of David's Israel, David's Judah, David's um, the bride, Zion, David's bride, and so on. So in uh, when... When in these days the bride is being raised up and the man-child at the head of the bride is being raised up, that's what we're talking about. It's not the physical kingdom of David come again. It's born again in spirit, right? What was, what was to the letter people was letter and what's to the spirit people is spirit. So this is what is being raised up. And so this temple cannot be a physical temple. But it is a temple that only those circumcised in heart will be in. And we'll come back to that too. And that's neat. Because there is such a kingdom on this earth being built. 
um, just the foundations being laid, but the temple, who, which is the people, are coming. don't know how many of you have read uh, The Shepherd of Hermas and how the, the stones were picked out and, and different things were shown about the stones, why they were qualified, why they weren't qualified. Just an awesome teaching, you know, about building the temple. And so this is what we're talking about. And, you know, um, <clears throat> again, when David uh, was first made king, he went to Jerusalem and uh, drove out the Jebusites, and it was called the city of David at that time, uh, Jerusalem. And, of course, that represents the, the false old leadership who had been ruling, was no longer ruling. Uh, God had taken away their, any kind of gift that they had to rule. It was kind of like the Saul situation, you know. Um, Saul had to be removed for David to come. And Saul was, you know, totally fallen away from the Lord. And he said, when we went back outside, the Hispanics were having a huge yard sale in the front lawn. And there were mountains of clothes thrown in huge piles onto the sidewalk and uh, onto the wayside, if you will, <laughs> and boxes of stuff everywhere and more wild children running all over the place. Again, this is not has nothing to do with the Hispanics. It's a parable. It has to do with the factious. And um, she said, once we had climbed over the mountain of clothes to get back onto the sidewalk. Climbed over the mountain of clothes. You know, let me say this. that Those factious who have failed in their love trial with God's people. In other words, we're all being tested. And faction is the opposite of love. It's criticism. It's judgment. Of course, when you judge, you are judged, it, and all these things. It's all these things. And when you fail that test, then the Lord just removes them. And uh, But they quickly discard the garments because the way the Lord is removing them is turning them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. And they quickly discard their garments of Jesus' works and likeness. That's what the garment represents. And the righteous have to endure the clothes of the impure, representing their works, until they are removed as leaven. Of course, Romans 13 and 13 states this very clearly. Let us walk becomingly, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, which can be compared to what's going on here, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and jealousy, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Put on Jesus as a garment. We do that. And we walk by faith. And uh, 2 Corinthians 11 and 15 says, it's, Is it no great thing, therefore, if his ministers also fashion themselves as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works? In Titus 3, 5, it says, uh, Not by works done in righteousness, which we did ourselves, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, and don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Right? The garments were discarded. The garments that were accepted in the kingdom uh, were discarded. And sold cheap at a garage sale. And you know what I'm talking about? Uh, those clothes don't ever go for much at a garage sale. And it's they don't hold them very valuable, in other words, you know. And uh, she said it was becoming daytime. Oh, praise the Lord. I do believe that it has to do with the, the coming light. You know, as the sun arises, as the S-O-N arises, the darkness wanes, and so do the foreigners. In Malachi 3 and 16, we're told, Then they that feared the Lord spake one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard, and a book of remembrance was written before him 
for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, even mine own possession. In the day that I make, I will spare them as a man spares his only son that serves him. Do you want to be spared in these days to come? You know, if you've been with us for a while, you know something about these days that are coming. And the Lord is going to spare the sons that serve him. Bond servants are different, you know, but sons are going to be spared. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked. In other words, the people that are looking on are going to know the difference between, and the reward, by the way, uh, of those who are righteous and those who are wicked. Between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. So they will understand. And chapter 4 and verse 1 goes on to say, For behold, the day cometh, and it burneth as a furnace. And all the proud, and all that work wickedness, shall be stubble. Notice that. All of the proud, and all that do evil deeds. They don't have on the garment of Jesus, right, of his works. They have their own works. And they shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Sounds like all the head was wood, hay, and stubble. And that is true of some people. That's all they've got. They have turned to their own ways completely and are not doing the works of Jesus Christ nor submitting to the headship of Jesus Christ. So, But unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, in its wings, excuse me, and you shall go forth and gamble as the calves of the stall. You know how calves gamble, you know, they, you know, they uh, jump and run around and just have a really good old time, you know. And it's going to be like that for the people that are righteous before the Lord, they're going to be in confidence. They will fear no more, the Bible tells us. Uh, the blessings of God will be upon them. And you shall tread down the wicked. The wicked won't know where their judgment is coming from in some cases. But it's going to be coming from the righteous. It always is. All the way through the Bible, it's spoken out of the mouth of the righteous people. For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I make says the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, even statutes and ordinances. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with the curse. I do believe that this is the John the Baptist revival, which is coming now. And that's what it's for, is to turn the children and the parents back together, you know, and and not just physical parents, spiritual parents too. And that's what John's coming for. The spirit of John the Baptist is coming. It It is here now. The children of God will recognize their true spiritual fathers and turn their hearts towards them. Amen. And uh, Eve said, We then went back to tell David that the Hispanics were wreaking havoc on his house, where their new meeting place was to be. Well, you know, what came... (laughs) It's interesting. that We're living a repetition of history of this verse that I want to share with you concerning the house of David. Listen to it carefully. This is history repeating in our day. Acts 15 and 4. Simeon hath rehearsed how first God visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, 
After these things I will return, and I will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen. Well, it's being rebuilt, saints. The house of David. And um, being rebuilt. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men may seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, says the Lord, who maketh these things from of old. It's only for the Gentiles on whom his name is called, right? And the name, of course, means nature, character, and authority. The house of David is for the people who have the nature, character, and authority of Jesus. Right? That's what it's for. And, of course, the leaven has to be removed. And that's the process that we've been in, but we're coming out of. And uh, Ezekiel 28 and 24 says, And there shall be no more a pricking briar unto the house of Israel. Isn't that something? Uh, You know, uh, Paul spoke about the thorns in your sides, you know, talking about those that persecuted God's people, you know. And so he's saying, No more a pricking briar unto the house of Israel, nor a hurting thorn of any that are around about them. Well, how is this going to be? Well, you remember what he said to the Philadelphia church, that they were going to escape the hour of trial? It didn't have anything to do with flying away, as some people say. But the church of brotherly love is going to have this protection from God right here. Because they've already been through their tribulation. They've already been persecuted by the wicked over and over and over for years. And um, and God is uh, going to see to it that now it's the rest of his people's turn to um, bear their cross, endure their trial to the end, and come into the image of Jesus Christ through a a spiritual crucifixion. It's nothing to fear, saints. Uh, You've got everything to win here. You will lose some flesh, (laughs) but you've got everything to win here, right? And... um, nor a hurting thorn of any that are round about them, that did despite unto them. And they shall know that I am the Lord. Yes, true. The persecutors are going to know that he is the Lord. Amen. Joel 3 and 17 says, So shall we know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. Once again, folks, uh, this is not a physical Jerusalem. You can obviously see that. The physical Jerusalem is full of strangers that don't know God. Even according to the old covenant, they don't know God. It's just full of people. It's a mess. And Paul doesn't give it a very good description in Galatians 4 and 5 either. It's fallen. I don't know why Christians want to glorify it for some reason. They don't understand about spiritual Jerusalem, which there are no strangers in. But I mean, that is, uh, you know, is obviously talking about people that are strangers to God. It's his place of his temple and the place of his holy bride. Now, Zechariah 14 and 21 says, Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holy unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and boil therein. And in that day there shall be no more a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Well, the Canaanites were, of course, all the Gentiles that resisted Israel taking the land that God gave to them, as they do today, by the way. The spiritual Canaanites are all around us. And Eve said, um, 
This is a, a second dream that immediately followed the first and is an extension of it. And it starts out, you know, kind of where the first one left off. It says, she said, once we were over the mountain of clothing from the Hispanic yard sale, Michael went back to David's house to tell him about the squatters so that he could evict them. And uh, Eve said, as I said, I asked Father for a verse for this dream I had on the Sunday afternoon of the 17th and received Jeremiah 12:14 on. And her finger was on, I will pluck them up. And here it is in context. Thus saith the Lord against all mine evil neighbors that touch the inheritance which I have caused my people, Israel, to inherit. The spiritual Canaanites, right? Behold, I will pluck them up from off their land and will pluck up the house of Judah from among them. And it shall come to pass that after that I have plucked them up, I will return and have compassion on them. And I will bring them again, every man to his heritage and every man to his land. What was the purpose when God took his people into bondage because of their own rebellion took them into bondage to humble them, to chasten them, to crucify their old flesh. It was his purpose all along to bring them back. Except, of course, that those that died in another land or maybe were reprobated and did not come back. So it was his purpose you know, to cleanse his people of all evil. And we've studied the, the, uh, the house of Israel in, in Babylonish bondage, and uh, they were much closer to God um, in bondage than they had been at home because they learned their lesson that the reason that they were there was because they rebelled against God. Uh, they held closer to their, their laws, they, they um, drew closer to God, and they came to the place where they cried out in their bondage, just like when they were in Egypt, and the Lord heard them and brought them back to their land. And once again, this is true of the, the faction against God's people, God's bride. And verse 16 says, And it shall come to pass that if they will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name, as the Lord liveth, even as they taught my people to swear by Baal, so it was another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel, right? Then shall they be built up in the midst of my people. But if they will not hear, then will I pluck up that nation, plucking up and destroying it, says the Lord. Which he did. He did it several times, and he did it because of the same purpose. They disobeyed his word, they disobeyed his prophets, they persecuted the prophets, they killed the prophets, etc., etc., etc. The stone which the builders rejected became the head of the corner, right? So those who have fallen away through faction demons will be plucked up to cleanse the house of spiritual foreigners. And those of the elect will repent and be returned out of captivity. And the reprobates will not. And Merlene had a wonderful dream about this. I'm going to share with you, but probably not today. About a fish going into the house and going out a side door. But then turning around and coming back, you know. And I think it has everything to do with um, people coming back. Not everybody at one time. Uh, it won't be that way. It'll, it'll be in stages. So he said, I, I began walking over to my house, which was next to David's. And when I went inside, there was nothing in the house, and it was totally clean. The lights were off, and I knew this was because UBM was leaving to go somewhere soon. 
and she puts, and I agree with it, into the wilderness. And uh, let me just say that the leadership has going to have new quarters up on the hill of Zion. And this means at this point that the man-child has manifested throne authority because Jesus, the king, has come in them, which fits the rest of his dream about the king. Now suddenly it changes from just the Davids to the king. <laughs> Because that's what we're talking about. That's the change that's being made here. And uh, she said, I knew that I, and I, and I believe I here is, is Eve, a type of the bride, uh, needed to go and report to the king. Well, because he just got through saying that he was, they were all, EBM was getting ready to go somewhere. They were going into the wilderness. And this kingdom is being built in the wilderness. Yeah. So, the leadership has new quarters up the hill of Zion. And this means at this point, the man-child has manifested throne authority. And uh, Jesus, the king, has come in them. Which is like when David was anointed king, Right. To sit on God's throne, by the way, it says at least twice in scriptures. You know, the Lord has a throne on the earth. It's the throne of David. Scripture says so. People don't understand when they talk about the man-child being caught up to the throne. It's not the throne in heaven that they're going to sit on at this point in history. It is the throne of David. And, of course, this... This fits the rest of the dream about the king. So she she said, I knew, um, as a type of the bride, I needed to go and report to the king. His land and castle were at the base of the hill, on the cul-de-sac of the UBM neighborhood street. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, he, you know, he, he's going to rule where there is unleavened bread. Right? He is the unleavened bread. He gives out the unleavened bread. He makes his children out of unleavened bread. He makes his sons manifest because the unleavened bread is in them. So, I mean, you know, it's not just UBM as a, a local organization we're talking about here. Uh, she said the UBM hill was on the king's property, and he owned all the lands that were surrounding. Uh, the, the day grew brighter as I reached the castle, and it was bright and sunny by the time I went in to see the king. The castle was made of stone. Oh, awesome. As I walked in through the front entrance, I saw the king standing in the foyer, and behind him I could see part of his throne room. There were scarlet and purple banners embroidered with golden thread with all his different names on them and musical arrangements of notes of praise on them. They were hung up high on the stone walls all around the throne room and to each side of the foyer. The king had on his rich robes and had a golden crown on his head and a golden scepter in his hand, both with many precious stones in them. He had a beard and a deep voice that boomed when he spoke. Yes, and of course, he is the Lord. It's not the body that is the great thing here. It's the Lord inside the body, right? just as it was before. He had gathered all of his children into the foyer, and they were all very quiet and obedient, standing with their hands clasped together, looking up at him. And they were all different ages, and all looked kind of alike. She said they all reminded her of Philip's Philip's children but even more alike than in real life. But the king was angry and frustrated. 
because his daughter had committed adultery and was pregnant by a strange man that was not part of his kingdom. Uh, does that sound familiar? Okay. The king's daughter, who received the seed of the beast through the factious leaders, and not the word, is defiled. You know, uh, Jesus and the man-child will judge them both, as we've seen many times in Revelations and the Scriptures and so on. Hosea 5 and 3 on is this story. The Lord said, I know Ephraim. Remember, Ephraim was the, the second-born son of Joseph, who was a clear, clear type of the man-child. And, um, but he was given the, fir- the inheritance of the firstborn son. And that represents the church. And the church was given the inheritance of Israel. Or the spiritual iner- inheritance. You know, the physical inheritance of natural Israel was given to them by God. But they were not to stop with that. In the New Testament, they were being offered the spiritual and heavenly uh, inheritance uh, that the the natural is just a symbol of, it's just a parable of. Okay, The important thing is that you're born into the kingdom of God, the real kingdom of God, not David's kingdom, not the kingdom of natural Israel, but the spiritual born-again Israel. That's the important thing. And they and many of them, multitudes of them, missed it. Like Jesus told Nicodemus, I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hid from me. For now, O Ephraim, thou hast played the harlot. Israel is defiled. Yeah, the king's daughter committed adultery and received the seed of a strange man, right? which is what the harlot is all about. Their doings will not suffer them to turn unto their God. For the spirit of whoredom is within them. And they know not the Lord. The pride of Israel does testify to his face. Therefore Israel and Ephraim shall stumble in their iniquity. Judah also shall stumble with them. That's the full full gospel people who fell away, which are many. And they shall go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord. But they shall not find him, for he hath withdrawn himself from them. It's true. They will not be able to find him. Verse 7. They have dealt treacherously against the Lord, for they have borne strange children. That's because they have lain with a strange man, a beast of sorts. This faction thing is a strange man. Now shall the new moon devour them with their fields. Blow ye the cornet in Gibeah and the trumpet in Ramah. Sound an alarm in Beth Aben. Behind thee, O Benjamin, Ephraim shall become a desolation in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel have I made known that which shall surely be. The princes of Judah are like them that remove the landmark. You know, the word gives us our boundaries. We don't add to or take from the word, or we will be cursed, as the last four verses say. And uh, we can't go beyond our boundaries. We have to stay on the narrow path. The broad road is for the sinners, and they won't find eternal life there. And I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. Ephraim is oppressed. He is crushed in judgment because he was content to walk after man's command. 
school. Well, that's true. The queen was dressed in a dark green velvet dress and was standing there arguing in front of the children with the king. Hmm, that's not a smart thing to do, but that's really where a lot of people are. They're arguing with God. They're not just submitting to him. And the queen is the the leadership of the apostate Christianity, the mother of the harlots. You know that any movement like the factious movement, the false revival movement, is just one of the harlots, just one of the daughters of the mother harlot who has departed from the king because they've received a strange seed, right? She said, how do you know the child is not yours? He is yet unborn. The king pointed to the stone wall behind his children and in an angry voice said, Because there is no certificate on the wall for him. So the fruit of this daughter harlot is not Jesus or his word. It's strange fruit, strange children. And I looked at the wall behind the children, and there were many crimson certificates hanging on the wall one for each child, with the large golden embossed music notes in different arrangements according to their specific praises that they represented to the king. Each one was unique. So they were not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, right? You know, I was telling somebody just the other day about the numerics in the Bible, how that there's patterns on top of patterns on top of patterns, uh, skip sequences on top of six skip sequences, and every letter is used many, many, many times. And I was talking about how it was just a, a Bible software, you know, um, a computer software. And I, I told him I thought the Lamb's Book of Life was in there. And I say that because Christians' lives and the things that they do are written there. I discovered that back when I was doing Bible code research years ago. And uh, it's astounding how much there can be in one book. There's not just one book there. There's many, many, many books there. And it is astounding. So... uh but anyway, this, these, this fruit was not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Psalm 69 and 28 says, Let them be blotted out of the Book of Life. Meaning they had to have been in there at one time. And not be written with the righteous. So you have to overcome to stay in the Book of Life. If you don't, you lose it. It's very clear here. Uh, sad to tell you folks out there that might believe once saved, always saved, but no, it don't work that way. You can get blotted out. Revelation 3 and 5, He that overcometh shall thus be arrayed in white garments. And I will in no wise blot his name out of the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. And in uh, 20 and 12, we're told, And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. Well, listen, saints. If you you repent of your sins, he won't remember them. But if you live in your sins, he will remember all of your past sins. So, repent. Don't uh, don't walk in any kind of willful disobedience. Observe the Lord's word. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. 
And 20 and 15 says, And if any was not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire, as it shall be. And verse 27, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything unclean, or he that maketh an abomination and a lie, but only they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. Yeah. In verse 19, 22 and 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and out of the holy city, which are written in this book. You know, the revelations we've received uh, point out that the faction, when people fall into it, they die. Because they're unforgiven, so they're not forgiven. They have none of God's benefits, you know. They die. And of course, God is, like he did to Nebuchadnezzar, quite able to uh, show them that they're just a beast. Which Solomon also said, that God would show to men that they are but beasts, you know. So, I mean, if God turns you loose, you will fall back into that hole and under that rock that you crawled out from under. And that's how he humbles people that get proud and arrogant. Oh, God has so many ways to do that. And Eve said, I couldn't believe that the queen would have the nerve to talk to the king like that. But she loved her adulterous daughter. Sounds sounds a lot like Vashti, doesn't it? <laughs> She loved her adulterous daughter more than him and conspired with her to keep the illegitimate child a secret from him. And the king was furious with the queen and ordered her out of his presence. Oh, that once again sounds like that, doesn't it? The Vashti-Esther situation. Now we know Vashti uh, represents Israel who rebelled against God as a harlot, rebelled against God, and um, he rejected them for the New Testament church. But also, in the church, there's the same situation. So, I mean, there are more parables than one concerning this. In the, in the church, there's the same situation. There is this mother of harlots that thinks she's Christian, but she's no longer Christian. They might even have had an experience with the Lord in the beginning. But they're no longer Christian. They are no longer the bride, so to speak. They've been rejected for another bride that's coming forth in our day. So the mother of the harlots is reprobated. Hosea 2 and 2. Contend with your mother. Contend, for she is not my wife. Notice that. Not my wife. Neither am I her husband. And let her put away her whoredoms from her face and her adulteries from between her breasts. So he has rejected her. His harlot was rejected just like Vashti was. For the same reason, stubborn rebellion against him and his word. So, Eve, as a type of the bride, said this. I stepped forward, and I asked him if there was anything I could do to help. And when he saw me, his whole countenance and demeanor softened. Why, sure. (laughs) It's the Vashti Esther all over again. In another parable, isn't it? Yes, of course. Yes, and it's happening. It's it's so sad. So many people out there, they may have started with the Lord, but they got trapped and turned aside by false religion. And um, there's much of that in Christianity. And uh, didn't obey the king. And as such, had relations with men who sowed another seed in them, Besides the seed of the kingdom, which is the word. And that's all over Christianity, saints. If, if what it could the child, how could the fruit of a denomination 
turn out to look like Jesus if they receive the pablum that they're receiving? How could it happen? It's just not possible. You see, the Lord is, (laughs) that which is born from above is what God is calling to be his. And these people have a chance to repent and come out of her, my people, that you don't partake of her judgments. Right? They have a chance. And that's why this great revival is coming, both the the John the Baptist revival and uh, the man-child revival. That's why it's coming. It's coming to bring them out from among them, you know, before it's too late, which is very soon. It's very soon. He came over and smiled down at me and put his big heavy arm around my shoulder and pointed to a large arched wooden door with two large metal rings bolted onto it and said, go and check on that room over there. So she asked if there's anything that she could do to help. And um, and this is what he said, go and check on that room over there. So I went over and went inside the room. And I realized it was UBM's room. And uh, there was a, a large square window with sunshine streaming into the room. Now, there was plenty of the word of the sun, right? S-O-N. And there was a, a large red bin under the window, like the ones at the hospital that I work at, to put contaminated instruments into after the surgeries. That's interesting. The Lord likens things to things that we know about and we experience every day and so on and so forth. But this red bin, remember this, because we'll come back to this, this red bin was for the contaminated stuff, the unclean, the defiled. Okay. In the center of the room was a four by five foot rounded metal frame with a blinking computer tower turned on its side, wired up to three hardcover black cases and two opaque white five-gallon fuel canisters. <laughs> fuel canisters. It was a ticking time bomb. Wow. Well, the daughter harlot with her strange children and her factious head plan to destroy UBM. As they have said many times, I'm telling you, they have told me, texted me, and told me that they were going to destroy UBM. And so far, they've been doing this for the last five years, and they've failed. (laughs) Uh, But the failure is about to come to an end, because it's not going to go any further. Because it's all going to fail. Because their father, at this time, is not God. I'm not saying it's always going to be that way. I do know that some of them are going to be granted repentance, and we pray for that here all the time, constantly. We're praying and beseeching the Lord to set the captives free and open the prison to them that are bound, right? Because we knew many of these people. We knew they had problems, but we we also knew that we loved them when we overlooked their problems, and um, they loved us and we loved them, but There came a time that God said, nope, i got to clean this up. And so, if they didn't deal with it, they they were turned over. So, Eve said, I knew that I had to disarm it quickly. That is the ticking time bomb in, in the UBM house. So, I went over and knelt down next to it and began to unplug all the wires from the computer tower. Then Greg came into the room with Don and Merlene and Missy, and and he asked me if I needed help dismantling the components of the bomb. And I said, yes, please. Well, you all you you folks out there can help. (laughs) All you got to do is cast down the works of Satan, right? You exercise authority that the Lord gave you over all the power of the devil and the enemy. And nothing shall in any wise hurt you, right? 
so we have authority to dismantle all of their bombs. I think they threatened me, let's see, was it last year? Uh, at the be- yeah, last year at the beginning of the year they told me that they were going to destroy UBM and myself, you know. I says, okay. <laughs> I don't want to ever argue with them. And uh, when Merlene saw the bomb, she pointed at it and exclaimed, that's what I dreamed about. Well, truly, you know, Merlene gets lots of dreams and and um, a lot of brethren here, too, do. And nothing hard gets by us, I don't think. And then I noticed a large, uh, muscular, Celtic, or Viking looking man standing in the corner of the room with his arms crossed, kind of like Mr. Clean. Except he he had long red hair and a long red beard that was braided on both sides. Well, uh, the red there identifies Esau. Red, you know, Edom, red. These are the seed of Esau, who sold their birthright through a root of bitterness against their brother Israel. Hmm. They also wore a green plaid kilt of some sort. I thought he looked just like a factious man that I know, and, and I know this person too, and it's amazing. It is amazing, but anyway. Uh, and when I looked at him, Excuse me, a factious man that I know when I looked at him. Yeah, we know this guy. I also believe that this entity represents the factious strong man trying to take the other seven who were followed by the vultures with him. That's a a dream in which there were eight vultures flying from the right to the left. They were following something that they believed was about to be dead, and and Abraham was crying out for his children because they were dying, you know. It's amazing. I don't know if I've shared that one or not. And in that dream, eight were in danger of dying and falling to the factious vultures, and Abraham was crying. But the, the one man that she knew fell. That was the man that she described here, leaving seven. And it seemed in that dream that he was going to lead them astray. And in the natural, he did fall, just as she saw. But now we see he can't have the seven. Because uh, the fact that strong man was trying to take the other seven, but we'll notice that he didn't, wasn't able to do that. Praise God. And we were praying for these, this other seven too. We were praying because we knew the dream was right. We prayed for these other seven. And guess what? This is what happened. He was trying to blend in with us in the UBM room, and he was. In the castle. As the, the Edomites among the Israelites, you know. But Merlin and I recognized him for what he was, a foreigner. Mm-hmm. And by the time uh, Brandy and Pam and some others showed up as well, we all worked quickly to dismantle the bomb and place all its components into the red bin under the window, which was made for all the unclean things. And all their efforts to destroy UBM for what reason? It's, It's stupidity, isn't it? It's all uncleanness. There's nothing but hatred. They make it their life's duty to destroy UBM because we didn't accept them after they fell into demonic captivity, you know, and obeyed the Lord. And uh, as sad as it was, you know, uh, once the bomb was safely dismantled and placed into the red bin, we went over to confront this foreign entity and when he realized we were on to him, his eyes grew very wide. This is, this is amazing because this is a description of this guy too. That's exactly what would happen. Uh, this wide-eyed person is the factious man that she just mentioned that we know. And it happened just that way. I mean, he was 
one of the eight in the dream. We told him ahead of time, hey, look, you're one of the eight here, and you're going to be dragging these other people. And, of course, he didn't believe it because none of them ever do. They won't. The dreams tell them exactly what they're going to do ahead of time, and they do it anyway because their minds are demon-possessed. He then panicked and jumped out of the window onto a wooden platform or balcony made of small logs. And when they are revealed, they always run. We know that. We've seen that. You know, once they were identified, you know, the demon can't hide anymore, so it takes them on off. We watched as the balcony collapsed under him, and, and when he hit the ground, two of the king's guards grab, grabbed him and put him in a large medieval-looking catapult. And they catapulted him far off into the wild and untamed wooded area off in the distance. This, this has a lot to do with what happened to this person, too. Anyway, into the wilderness tribulation where Jezebel and her children die, as the book of Revelation tells us. He said, I will kill them with death. And we all watched in amazement as he sailed through the air towards the wild places. Yeah, no more to defile UBM. And then I woke up, she says. Well, that's an amazing revelation. And, and so much of it has come to pass and is coming to pass and will come to pass. So. And, of course, she said, I asked for a word by faith at random and received Jeremiah 12 and 14. And her finger was on, I will pluck them up. I'll read it to you again, this portion of it. Thus saith the Lord, against all mine evil neighbors that touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I will pluck them up from off their land and will pluck up the house of Judah from among them. And it shall come to pass that after that I have plucked them up, I will return and have compassion on them and will bring them again, every man to his heritage and every man to his land. And that's, uh, I believe, concerning the dream that Merlin had that I'm going to share with you one day. And when they returned, they will no more be Edomites or factious. For their demons will be gone, cast out, exercised by the man-child, as we've seen in other revelations. Now, let me mention something to you that I, I really need you to pray for. Or several things that I really need you to pray for. Um, I believe revival is beginning. And, um, and I believe prayer is needed. Um, a revival has begun in West Virginia. I'm sure some of you know about it. Uh, I believe it's Mingo High School Prayer Club. Uh, seems to be where it started. And about two weeks later, uh, it moved into their football stadium. So it's pretty successful, I would say. You know, pretty much a, a big move there. And that was on April the 16th. So basically this started at the beginning of April, around the beginning of April in a much smaller way, and um, and it grew, and it's spreading. And you know that's God. It is uh, mostly about repentance and salvation. And it seems to be mostly clean. And, and the only reason I say that is I've read a bunch of articles on it just to see what was happening there, if it was a real revival or another false one, and of course, my interest is in, in, in wondering if this is the uh, spirit of Elijah and repentance, the spirit of John the Baptist and repentance uh, beginning a revival, because we know it comes shortly before the man-child revival, right? Now, however, when I read the articles, I did see that the false revival people have noticed it, and in including their false prophet organizations and are intent on invading this move. That's terrible. I mean, these, most of these things, these are kids, you know, and they certainly don't need this pollution. 
that's destroyed these people, even though they like the factious people. They don't know they're destroyed, for goodness sake, you know. And I believe this is the John the Baptist revival of repentance. And um, the spirit of Elijah, or John, is going forth to turn the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest, he said, they he come and destroy the earth with a curse, right? So, I asked the Lord to give me a sign that this was, and got two heads for yes. So, I'm asking everyone out there to pray for them and to do warfare against the wolves that are seeking to invade it. <clears throat> and there's a multitude of them. It's not just the false revival movement. It's the faction movement and everything else, you know, that's ready to pounce on them and destroy this. And these people believe they're Christians, for goodness sake. Yeah, um, pray for these kids and pray for this movement. You know, this has to lay the foundation for the man child there. People have to repent. When people repent, God leads them to truth. So a lot of you have shared your testimonies with me about how that you when you prayed you were just sick and tired of playing church and, and seeing all the apostasy in the church and you asked Lord to lead you to the truth and he did. Well, there's gonna be some of these kids doing the same thing. They're, they a lot of them probably have been, this is a, by the way, this is starting in a very poor area of the world. It didn't start in the rich, among the rich like the false revival did. That's why it's false. Um, it started with the very poor people that have most, almost nothing real high unemployment and everything in that area, you know. And um, that, that's where God would start a revival, I just gotta tell you. Uh, that's just so anyway the wolves are seeking to invade it so let's let's pray together and you you continue on praying about this would you please and do spiritual warfare for them well father in the name of jesus we desire earnestly that our young brethren that are coming into the kingdom not come face to face with this garbage uh we ask you to do a supernatural move that if they do come to face to face with them, uh, that the people that are in these cults will be brought to repentance themselves or flee. Uh, Lord, put the fear of God in them that they won't go around these people if they're just going there to pollute them. We ask you in Jesus' name, we bind you, the principalities and powers of Satan and Satan himself, we bind you from ruining this move of God in the name of Jesus, we command you to cease and desist and keep your deception in the name of Jesus. And also, uh, let's pray for the man-child revival, which is coming after the John the Baptist one, and will be with reforms and great signs and wonders. As you know, Jesus' ministry was a reformation, and uh, with great signs and wonders, so people paid attention to him. And that's what's coming after this. You say, will it be six months like it was between Jesus and John? I don't know that for sure. I know that's the type. I don't know how the type is going to be fulfilled exactly. The Lord hadn't told me yet. It could be a shorter time. You know, from the birth of the man-child Jesus until his ministry is certainly shorter than it was in Jesus' time. So, I mean, there's an equivalent there, you know, that we need to find, and I think only God can really tell us. But anyway, we know that this this uh, foundation of repentance is to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord, uh, and he's coming in his man-child ministry. So, uh, just like uh, John the Baptist prepared the way for the coming of Jesus, he is preparing the way for the coming of Jesus now. Because Jesus is coming in a much bigger body now to do a much bigger job. And so we praise God for that. And I mean, it will be all over the world. And this revival right here may go all over the world. I, they may not be missing it before, but I've heard some of the young people uh, say that it will, that are in that, and, you know, on the, on the articles that I've listened to and and read. 
So praise God. You know, praise God. And there also seems to be a great political revival of the right wing. And I don't, I don't say revival in the way of Christianity because there isn't any Christianity in it. But at least the guy that's, uh, the, the Trump who's on top right now and, um, been many dreams and visions that he was going to go in there. Um, He's got some things going for him. Even though he's not a Christian, he has some good things going for him. He's not a homosexual. That's good. <laughs> he's not a communist. That's good. He's not a, a, a Muslim. That's good. So, I mean, he, he can be used of God. I mean, um, Reagan was used of God, but he wasn't a Christian either. So, pray for him. I mean... You know, we were told to pray for our leaders so that we can live a peaceable life. Now, now we need to have um, about three and a half years of time for the reforms under the man-child to take root. And with the uh, present administration, it really looked like he was about to make war and still might in some ways before he gets out of there, but he was about to make war with his um, ISIS folks and um, his left-wing communists and uh, the, um, the homosexuals to bring down Christianity. And, and right now, um, with this revival coming and the reformer ministry coming, the Mantel ministry coming, there, there needs to be that, what we see in scriptures, that three and a half years of time of reforms. Like Jesus, who taught the disciples uh, in a relative time of peace. They weren't being killed off or anything like that. And, of course, at the end of that time, when they were fully formed, um, the beast made war on them. And that's what we expect, too. So, um, yes, there's going to be shakings. Absolutely. I asked the Lord if the, if this revival was going to set back any of the earthquakes, and I think the Lord told me no. And, uh, so, anyway, pray for that too. Uh, don't expect God to, you don't expect, and I don't expect for God to put a Christian in office. He wouldn't be a Christian very long if he did. But, um, to have somebody at least conservative can make more peace for us and an opportunity for the gospel to get out. It doesn't sound like the guy's going to put up with a lot of stuff. So uh, we'll see. So I uh, I asked for direction uh, concerning the faction movement. And God gave me Isaiah 36 and 37. And I, I saw there the prayers that Hezekiah and Isaiah prayed to God. And I prayed those prayers there um, against the invaders of the land to bring the bride into bondage. That's what they're there for. Uh, you know, like the Snickerb scenario coming up to Jerusalem thinking they're going to do the same to Jerusalem that they'd done with the rest of the Sinners among God's people, and it didn't work. Uh, so let's pray down this faction with one accord. God will hear us. And uh, please read and pray this text, that is Isaiah 36 and 37, uh, those prayers that are prayed there, to cast down Satan's plans through these demons and principalities and to bind their human resources Right? God will hear us. In fact, I think he's heard me because I've commanded of Satan to, to uh, cease and desist his war against his God's bride and uh, cease and desist to move these people and uh, pray to that, uh, of course, we have prayed that God would deliver them. And we know that the man child's going to do that. He's not only going to smite the demons. Remember the dream we had just, uh, I don't know, just a few weeks back, about um, the slaughter of the people that these demons were doing. I mean, we actually saw one of the last uh, 
people that was in our assembly get slaughtered. He screamed out like bloody murder. And, and he, he, he said he was falling into this deep, bottomless pit. And there was evil all around him. I mean, he was experiencing this as we were listening to him, screaming, just screaming like, you know, bloody murder. And, um, and then, you know, he had his hands over his face and he was shaken. And it was, it was an attack of the faction demons to take him out. And they did take him out. And believe it or not, the next day he preached that this was a wonderful experience. <laughs> Everybody there knew better, but he thought, he said it was a wonderful experience. You know, and I thought that's how deluded you get once they've taken you over. You just say what they want you to say, you know. Uh, so we, we pray and we cast down Satan's plans to cease and desist and to, uh, loose these people from their bondages. And we know it will come to pass. Saints, you agree with us on that. The Bible, in our morning meeting, we got three times in a row, uh, Matthew 18 and 19. If any two of you agree as touching anything, it shall be done by your Father. Now, what's the chances of that, you know? And what the Lord is saying is, join your faith together. God will hear it. It is powerful. Satan can't stand before you. And I, I sometimes ask the Lord to confirm the things that I feel that he says to me, not just for my sake, but for others too, because God confirms his word with signs. That's what the word says. Some people don't believe that, <laughs> but it's true. So I said, Lord, is this the end of the faction? And he said, no. And he confirmed it with uh, two tails, which is what I asked. And then I thought on her a minute, and I says, I didn't ask that right. I said, so then I reformed my question, and I said, is this the end of the faction if we believe? And he said, yes, and he confirmed it with two heads. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, you're not going to get nothing without faith, folks, if we believe. And I do believe. I do believe. Oh, praise be to God. I do believe. You believe with me, all right? Because the things that follow this you know, are both the deliverance of these people and, of course, the deliverance of the bride of this great persecution against her for no apparent reason. But there is a reason. Crucifixion always has a reason. And uh, so I asked for a confirmation, and I got Second Chronicles 32 and 20 through 23. Let me read that to you. And Hezekiah, the king, and Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amoz, prayed because of this and cried to heaven. And this was the Sennacherib scenario. Isn't that amazing? So we, we've always known this is concerning the faction, and that's what I got. Verse 21, And the Lord sent an angel who cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So, he returned with shame of face to his own land. And when he was come into the house of his God, they that came forth out of his bowels slew him there with the sword. And that is exactly what's going to happen to the factious leaders, their own... Factious children are going to turn against them, except they won't be factious anymore. And uh, 22 says, thus, saith the Lord, thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the bride, from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others. And he guided them on every side. And many brought gifts unto the Lord to Jerusalem, and precious things to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations from henceforth. 
And I, I also received uh, uh, 33 and 10. And the Lord spake to Manasseh. Remember Manasseh, he was the son of Hezekiah, who rebelled against the true God, representing the factious leadership, who was, these were all children that were raised up under me. And, um, and they were led away, he, he led away parts of Judah into gross apostasy. And that's exactly a good definition of the faction and the factious leader. And to his people, but they gave no heed. So the factious leaders and the people gave no heed after God spoke to them. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria. And we're seeing, of course, this host is a a demon army that has conquered uh, apostate Israel, apostate Judah, and has come up to the gates of Jerusalem and are smitten. So, he brought upon them the captains of the hosts of the king of Assyria who took Manasseh in chains. You can just imagine someone in spiritual bondage, right? And bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in distress, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly. Isn't this great? Now, I want to tell you that next to this text, I saw the names of three people that started factions uh, who I believe are coming back. I know others that have been reprobated and never coming back, but I know these three guys. I wrote their names next to this, Manasseh, because I knew they were coming back because the Lord gave me this text years ago, and I wrote their names there. And when he was in distress, he besought the Lord his God. Of course, he wasn't the Lord his God. He went after every other God out there. And humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And he prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. In other words, his spiritual father was right, but he wouldn't listen. So let's exercise our faith against this movement and drive it from our land, as the dream that we just shared shows. Michael Hare asked if the factious slander sites would be taken down and, and got Job 38, 12 through 15. And here's some of the phrases that are in there. The day spring, which I believe talks about the sun, or slash S-O-N, right? To know its place. The wicked be shaken out of it. It is changed. That is their slander sites. Their light is withholding. What they consider to be light is restrained. The high arm is broken. We just thought, oh my goodness, this this fits it so very well, you know. And Eve received uh, Psalm uh, 54 and 6. With a free will offering will I sacrifice unto thee. I will give thanks unto thy name, O Lord, for it is good. And we know that We just need to give thanks to God. I mean, for all things, even the things that we're believing Him for ahead of time, we just a free will offering. We thank Him, we praise Him, etc. It's done. Because He taught us to believe we have received everything that we pray and ask for, you know. For He hath delivered me out of all trouble. And mine eye 
has seen my desire upon mine enemies. Oh, praise be to God. She was also driving her car at night when a hawk swooped down and landed on the road just in front of her moving vehicle, and she ran over it. (laughs) And there wasn't even any food on the road. Uh, In other words, not a dead animal on the road or anything. Just an unreasonable thing. And and they, hawks don't hunt at night, you know. I mean, uh, owls do, but the hawks don't. Uh, we knew it was the same revelation given to us here about the hawk missing his prey, which was a messenger pigeon, a messenger of God, right, and slamming into the window in front of Michael Hare <laughs> that we shared in one of our last programs, you know. Hawks are just not this stupid, and they don't miss very often. They're they're just pretty very good at what they do, you know. What a sign. And uh, pray and fast for our brethren that are in captivity, that the Lord will bring them out, because he's going to do it. Okay. I'm going to share a couple other little revelations here with you. This is Eve's given on the 30th. In April. And uh, we called it the Tower of the Flock. You know what Micah calls the Tower of the Flock? It was the bride. It was Jerusalem, right? I had a dream this afternoon that, that is very encouraging for us. I dreamed that I was standing in the middle of the driveway as you topped the hill to Jeff and Sandy's house. It was sunny outside and almost a white sunlight like when the sun is close to or at the noon position and I saw all the local UBM brethren clearing all the vines and weeds away from the Shaw's house some pulling with their hands and others with tools well this is exactly what was happening We we had a cleanup day over there because lots of times we'll meet over there with a prayer meeting or whatever you know, and uh, we everybody just showed up and I mean they were real busy and Sandy's been sick and and Jeff's working so everybody just showed up over there and and went around the house and the stuff was growing up around the house and so everybody just jumped in there and just cleaned it up slick as a whistle it looked so nice. So that this would, they were doing this in the natural, but she was seeing this as a spiritual revelation in her dream. She said, exactly like we were doing in real life today. Well, in between where I was standing in the front corner of the house was a large square tower made of white stones. Now, this doesn't exist there, but it's a representation of the tower of the flock. The white stones makes you, it reminds you of the shepherd of Hermas. So she had this in a dream. Uh, in between where I was standing on the front corner of the house and the front corner of the house was a large square tower made of white stones. Three of the sides were complete. Ah, the bride's almost complete. And we were six or seven stones away from completing the fourth and final side. Isn't that amazing? So, of course, yes, this is good news. We're getting close, folks. The stones were all about a foot or so in diameter. And uh, the tower was larger at the base and more narrow as it reached the top. And uh, this is kind of like the tower I saw, you know, uh, in a vision before I I left Louisiana to go to Florida. And uh, it's a representation of God's people being joined together into one house, one people, one heart, one accord, like the bride. And like uh, Song of Solomon says the bride is, she's one. That means there can't be any faction in the midst. So, it's all coming together, folks. 
And if you remember the Shepherd of, if you haven't ever read the Shepherd of Hermas, you should, because it's just a, a good exercise in, in righteousness and correction for unrighteousness and so on and so forth. Just a very good, and, and the building of the, the bride there was just like that, the stones, the white stones. And some had cracks and had to be pushed off on the side, you know, and, uh, there was divisions between people, right? In other words, and these were just rejected, you know. Same as this situation. They, they've already been rejected, and but the stones are being put in the house. So they were down um, pulling the vines and so on and so forth. Let me finish it. It was flat on the top, almost like a huge stone altar. As the Brethren cleared away the wild vines and weeds out of the flower beds surrounding the house. They would uncover these stones, and then they would supernaturally disappear from the beds and reappear in their perfect position in the tower, which was almost as high as the roof of the house. And then I woke up. Well, it seemed like the stones were in bondage with the vines and all the weeds and stuff around them, and this had to be cleared out of the way in order to for the stone to be useful in the building. Well, that's what's been happening. Not only have the, the folks uh, here locally been constantly examining their hearts and turning to the Lord with everything and confessing anything that they needed to and just seeking God with all their hearts, you know. Uh, but the weeds have been pulled out and uh, the vines that you know, trip people up have been removed <laughs> and so on. So, and, and she said she also thought of the shepherd of Hermas when... Uh, she said, I began to meditate on this dream and what it meant. Pretty cool, huh? I praise God. And I, I, I'm thinking about the, the last stones here are the ones that were threatened to be taken out by this this man, this factious person. And they weren't taken out. And now we're seeing, yeah, they're going to go into the building. And then I got this Revelation from Anna Stewart on 427. She said, the dream I shared on the fellowship last night, and she's talking about the, the conference fellowship, last night was where Matthew and I were in an old red 90s model F-150 pickup, which we don't really have in real life. And we had three bales of hay in the back. We were driving up this narrow, one-way dirt road up a mountain, which is Zion. And the further up we got, the less hay we had. It was blowing out the back, right? And I said, by the time we get to the top of the mountain, we won't have any hay left. <laughs> I'm guessing you probably already figured it out, right? The wood hay and the stubble of the old life that has to be burned up in the fiery trial, you know, is is leaving as the bride goes to the top of the mountain, right? We're climbing to Mount Zion, right? And, uh, of course, the Lord's throne room is at the top. And uh, she said this represents the further up Zion we go, the less flesh we have, since Peter said all flesh is as grass. Yes, indeed. That's awesome. The, the three bales being the three glories. Yep, you can see that, or you can see uh, the perfecting of the body, soul, and spirit, you know, or uh, whatever. You know, good things you can see there for sure. And being in an old red truck may be the first ways that the apostles gave us, and the red being covered by the blood, and uh, the ride being in the rest, 
Amen. Anna did a good job here. And when we got to the top, there was a meadow. And, uh, which, you know, gives pleasant thoughts, right? And I saw a tornado. When we got to the top, now, you would think reaching the top is the throne room and that this would be the manifestation of the bride or the choosing of the bride, right? In other words, when the bride is finished and prepared for the marriage feast and the uh, groom to come uh, and, and, and so on, that's when judgment's going to fall. And I suspect from other dreams that the judgments will be things like earthquakes. By the way, they had an earthquake, was it today or yesterday? I think it was yesterday. 10,000 miles away, and it shook the whole earth. Literally, every monitor went off in the United States. Every seismograph went off in the United States and showed a tremendously big earthquake for being 10,000 miles away. Everyone in the United States. Can you imagine? And i got to tell you, they used to think that uh, far away earthquakes couldn't set anything off around you, but they changed their mind about that. Anytime you shake that much earth, you can shake something loose. So I believe that this tornado, which represents God's judgment, right, he hath his way in the world when the Bible says God's judgments and I believe earthquakes and economic crash are two of those. But she said I wasn't scared. So when the bride is mature enough to be chosen is what this is talking about. This judgment is going to come. And she said as it touched down the sky went black. Well, I'm sure you could think of a natural way. It could blackouts or just a time of judgment. And uh, she said, I could see stars and all the other planetary stuff, which you could never see with the naked eye. And straight up above were these two bright lights. Ooh. In the dream, I knew that they were two sons. Oh, my goodness. We've been expecting that, rascal. Or is it saying that when the bride is chosen, Planet X will be here? Well, you know, that could be right, because we know the man-child comes when the bride is chosen, and he comes in the middle of these earthquakes. As Hosea chapter 5, the very end of Hosea chapter 5 says, the Lord says he's going to come when his people are crying out to him, when they're turning to him with all their heart. And this, we've also seen that the earthquakes are going to be around the time of the, the revival, the great revival that's coming. I'm, I believe in that one is the man-child revival, but we'll see. No, I'm sorry, it's not. It's, it's, it's uh, at the time when repentance and crying out to the Lord comes, and then the man-child comes. Right? And, um, and then in the dream, I was telling you, Michael, what had just happened. So that's why I wanted to share it. Yeah, she sent this to Michael. And I thought, okay, well, we know when the two sons come, they're, when the one son that's... that's the uh, planet X's sun comes, we're going to have problems with earthquakes, right? So it seems like this is the judgment, that uh, the bride is going to be matured, chosen. We know at that time uh, that she stands out because all the others, all the competition has been slaughtered, <laughs> basically speaking. And uh, the bride's uh, standing after the rest. And uh, and at that time, the man-child comes out of hiding, according to the dream we had several weeks ago. And uh, he slaughters 
the enemies um, that have taken captive God's people. So neat timing here, you know, neat things. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, folks, they're getting very good with the chemtrails. <laughs> I mean, uh, they get up there early, early in the morning, and they streak across the sky in parallel streaks, nice and even now. And within moments, those come together, and you've got nothing up there but gray. Not a cloud one that doesn't appear any shapes or anything like that. It's just gray. They can gray out the whole sky. And we've watched them doing it. No, there's no mistaking, and we're not crazy. They're doing it. They're doing it with those planes. And they've gotten real good at it now. So they, I think they put some kind of static charge in this stuff so that it, it spreads out, you know, because it spreads out very quickly. It's amazing. So this looks like when the bride is chosen, uh, Planet X will be here. Wouldn't that be something? So, and then she shared another thing that I think is uh, important too. She said, well, I don't know if i got time. No, probably not. Maybe we'll try this another time. It's time to pray. Glory be to God. Well, Father, we do take authority over the principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness that have slaughtered your children and have brought them into bondage. And we bind you, Satan, and we bind all your underlings, and we command you to cease in Jesus' name of attacking the bride, attacking the man-child, attacking the God's people. We command you to cease. We cast down your authority in Jesus' name. We forbid you. What we bind on earth is bound in heaven. What we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. We bind you in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you for the victory that you've shown us that you're going to give us today, Lord. We receive it. He said, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you received them and you shall have them. And so we believe, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. And Lord, uh, um, greater days are coming for the church. I'm so happy for these young people that are coming to the Lord. And I do believe it's, it's even uh, spreading over toward, to the West Coast. It's spread. Mm-hmm. And uh, praise God, folks. Pray for uh, a move of repentance in your area. Pray for it. Pray for it. Father, we do pray that a move of repentance will spread all over this world. That the John the Baptist spirit will be, the Elijah spirit will be all over this world, granting repentance. And um, and preparing for the coming of the man-child ministry. Oh, Lord, thank you so much, Lord. We put our trust in you, Lord, to bring it. Because this is going to be just wonderful. Just wonderful. Lord, thank you for raising up new leadership for the church. The uh, the men who have walked in the flesh and received their certificates and led your people astray and led them away from the gifts of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, everything it even has to do with Jesus and his ministry. They have led them away from to foolish doctrines that destroy any kind of motivation to walk holy before you, Lord. We ask that you bring all that garbage down, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And help us, Lord, for we want to be helpers in this harvest. Help us to help you and to help our brethren. And, uh, Lord, thank you, Lord, for helping us to get the books out so that people can pick up on these and study the Word of God concerning these situations. And uh, thank you, Father, uh, for the move of your Spirit among us. Uh, We praise you and we thank you, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we we ask, too, that um, 
you continue to show us step by step the things that are coming down the road. We ask that you give confirmations to our brethren out there who are listening. And we ask that you put a spirit of prayer in everybody that's listening today. That they would call upon your name to bring these things to pass. And uh, that uh, they also would defend uh, these young people who are coming into the kingdom. Which it doesn't stop with the young people, folks. It's just going to continue on to the parents and the siblings and so on and so forth. Yep, it's going to keep it going. So, Father, we just ask you, Lord, to keep it going. Let it go so fast, just like it has done so far. Praise God. And, Lord, we just bind the wolves that are standing around this revival in an attempt to take it down. And uh, we bind and confuse the enemy. We bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. You will have no authority over these children, nor the ones that they're bringing the gospel to. And Lord, we know that the gospel is pretty, is a lot of old order in there, Lord, but it's enough for them to have the spark of life. And we know that the man-child ministry that comes along is going to restore the whole and full and complete and real gospel of the life of Jesus in us. Lord, we thank you for doing that in Jesus' name. Amen. You believe it, saints? My Lord Jesus